Okay, thank you, Mohammed, for the for the introduction, and thank you, Hiba, for and the KGA for the invitation to participate in this event. So, I have I think two challenges: is to try and get through my presentation in the strict 20 minutes uh, that Hiba has given me. I've got a little warning there, and the other challenge is to keep your interest levels up after this uh, the lunch. So, uh, the topic that's been assigned to me is to talk about early diagnosis in IBD and its importance and uh, in preventing complications. So these are my disclosures. So I'm gonna make it a simple, uh, the outline is gonna be simple. I'm gonna do a bit of a what, why, how, and some take home messages for you. So we're gonna start just to knowing the what and what the scale of the problem is in terms of in Kuwait, using looking at uh, local data in IBD and look at sort of the delayed diagnoses and, and the causes for, these, uh, for this issue. And then the why, the importance, why it's important to uh, diagnose IBD early, and then the how, and how we can tackle this issue, and what possible solutions uh, or, or algorithms or regimens we can implement to, to improve early diagnosis, and then hopefully summarize with a few simple take-home messages for everyone. So, so a bit of epidemiology about Kuwait. So we're a small country, but we're pretty uh, densely uh, packed, as you can see also from today's attendance. So our, uh, and we've got a rapidly uh, a growing population. So you can see the census, the last census was last, uh, last year, and you can see there's a 1.4 uh, times increase in the, in the population. And Kuwait's one of the countries, there's a sort of discrepancy between the expatriates and citizens with a um, sort of an inverse ratio with around two thirds of the population being uh, expatriates and around uh, one third being Kuwaiti citizens. The health system, uh, in a nutshell, it's, it's, so there, there's a seven, seven major government hospitals serving the entire population. There are two other hospitals, one for the armed forces and one for the Kuwait oil company employees and their families as well. Uh, so there is free health care to the Kuwaiti citizens and there are subsidized fees or insurance schemes for the expatriates. Uh, there is now an expanding private sector in Kuwait, especially with the launch of a state-sponsored insurance scheme called AFIA in the last sort of five years for retired civil servants, so where they have access now to both the MOH and the private sector for free. Uh, and there's an increasing burden of IBD anecdotally, but there's really no objective measures to guide physicians and also the, the payers. So ju I'll just go through sort of the data that's, that's published. I'll take you from on, a, on a trip from the earliest data that we have regarding epidemiology of IBD in Kuwait up until the most recent. So this is the first publication that I came across. I was published in the Red Journal in the 80s by uh, Professor Naqib's uh, team. And at that time, IBD was pretty rare in the Middle East. And uh, I th that was uh, the cohort from the Amiri Hospital, which at that time was the, the major hospital serving the, almost the entire country, and over a period of six years, there were 91 patients diagnosed with osteocolitis as 17 with Crohn's disease. So if you do your calculations based on the population at that time, you get sort of an incidence rate of around 2.27 for UC per 100,000 person years, and for CD around 0.177, so pretty sort of low incidence rates at that time. Uh, next, so there was uh, Dr. Sadiq has published uh, quite a few publications looking at the, the epidemiology of IBD in Kuwait, and this was one that was published in IBD around 10 years ago, looking at the, um, the epidemiology of Crohn's disease based on the Montreal classification. So just to remind our residents and medical students what the Montreal classification of Crohn's disease is, so it basically uh, classifies the phenotype of Crohn's disease based on three, diff three uh, aspects, looking at the age, the location of the disease, and the, whether in the small bowel or colon or both, and uh, also the behavior of the disease, where it's, a, it's a, depending whether it's just an inflammatory disease or a fibrostenotic or a penetrating one that has abscesses and fistulas, and then perianal involvement. So in that particular cohort, uh, it was a pretty young population, so the, the mean age of diagnosis was around, was around 20 years, and there was no significant difference uh, between the, in the genders, between in the patients. And if you look at the distribution according to the Montreal classification, so the majority of the disease was ileal, um, and most of it was the, the inflammatory, non-stricturing, non-penetrating. Uh, and however, the significant number of patients, or a third of the patients, um, had perianal disease on presentation. So quite a significant number had, which is just for residents, it's a, it's a pretty severe form uh, of, of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, 
So that was uh, moving on to Ulster Colitis. So that was a, a publication that was uh, by also the Amiri team around maybe 20 years ahead after the, the initial publication in the 80s that was published by Dr. Shamali's team. And they looked at uh, around 346 patients with, with Ulster Colitis there uh, that were diagnosed over around a 15 year period. And their calculated incidence rates uh, for this cohort was around, based on the population, was around 2.8. Remember, it was 2.2 around 20 years before that. So there was an increase, notable increase in the number of uh, ulcerative colitis cases. And the majority of the, of around half of these patients uh, presented with a, with a pancolitis. So looking at the gender, it's, it's, uh, the, the age was, well, there's no difference in the gender. And in terms of the age, it was around a decade older compared to Crohn's, which was the mean age was around 20. So you've got to run uh, in the third decade. Um, and this was the second follow-up study by Dr. Siddiqui Seem looking at the Montreal classification for ulcerative colitis. Um, and just to remind you of the, the Montreal classification for UC, similar to one for Crohn's disease, but we use the, the extent of disease is looked at in terms of how extensive it is in the colon. You've either got a proctitis in the rectum or you've got a left-sided colitis before the splenic flexure, and then you've got anything beyond the splenic is called, it's called extensive ulcerative colitis. And looking at it, it's pretty similar. I mean, the, you can see the age, the mean age is similar as Dr. Shamali's publication. So it's around in the 30s, uh, the, sorry, the mean age. And the number of patients with severe pancolitis was around the same, around half of the patients. Um, so this was a study that uh, I worked on with Dr. Abdel Nabi from Sabah Hospital. I think there was a follow-up as well by Dr. Iqbal looking at genetics of, uh, of IBD in Kuwait. So this was a, uh, around 90 patients with Crohn's disease and 210 healthy controls. Uh, and we looked at the, polymorph the, the prevalence of the polymorphisms of NOT2 among these Kuwaiti uh, patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, and not take too much of your time, but just to if you look at the sort of mean, mean allele frequencies, you can see they're quite low compared to what's seen in the West, which, you, which are usually much, much more frequent. So you do see them, but they're slightly, um, they're lower than what's seen in the Western population, and we'll touch on, touch on that later on. And uh, in the multivariate analysis, what was, what was significant is that patients that had multiple polymorphisms had tended to have more complex disease and more of a penetrating behavior. However, uh, as you can see, the, it doesn't seem to be very significant. I know it was a small cohort, but this, I, thi I think this uh, may indicate that there is a, a larger maybe environmental role in the development of IBD in Kuwait, which I think is something that is uh, worth uh, looking at. And there was a trend towards a more IBD-related surgery in patients with multiple polymorphisms, but that wasn't statistically significant. So moving on to the next, so just looking at the sort of delayed diagnoses. Um, and what are the reasons for a delayed diagnosis in IBD, both internationally and locally? So the immediate time in general in the literature from symptom onset to IBD diagnosis is already quite delayed. So this is data from the Swiss IBD cohort and, and the data from North America from Virginia. And you can see the median time for diagnosis of Crohn's disease is around nine months. And for us of colitis is, is, is less, it's around three months. And the delay is always in the data, the, the pattern is the same. So the delay is always more significant for Crohn's disease compared to ulcerative colitis, and I think uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact of the hematochesia that you see in ulcerative colitis. It's, uh, it's very alarming for both the patient and the physicians, and the patient does get an expedited workup uh, compared to Crohn's disease that might have a grumbling uh, sort of course that's not very clear to the physician. And we know the diagnostic delay in IBD is, is, is associated with uh, poor outcomes uh, as well as impaired quality of life and increased risk of intestinal surgery. So what are the, the sources of diagnostic delay? This is something we looked at with the, uh, with a group of IBD experts in the, in the Gulf, um, published that in a, in a primary care journal actually. And uh, there, there's a delay in, in two aspects. There's a delay in the presentation of the patient to the healthcare professional and then from the healthcare professional to the gastroenterologist. So the, uh, there is a median in most of the literature, there is a, around one to two month delay for any IBD patient to present to seek medical care. So the, ten, the patients tend to wait a little bit before they present to their primary care, even uh, physician. And another pattern we notice is especially here in Kuwait uh, that we have the, what's called doctor shopping. So the patients, because they have access now to private sector, free healthcare, both in the MOH and, and, and in the public and the private sector, they tend to seek multiple medical opinions before they embark on, on or start definitive treatments. Uh, 
And the second element of the delay is from the healthcare professional to the gastroenterologist, be it a primary care, internal medicine, or even surgery. And there are two patterns that we notice. So there's an under-referral and an over-referral. So the under-referral is, is, was thought to be due sometimes lack of knowledge or confidence in diagnosing IBD, or maybe not having the tools to secure diagnosis. And I think there was some data from um, Mahmoud uh, Mosley's team uh, that looked at that, and a lot of primary care physicians are not confident making the diagnosis of IBD. Another pattern which we see personally, I see in my hospital, for example, is over-referral, where you've got an overcrowded primary care health system that just refers the majority of patients with GI complaints to secondary care, whether internal medicine or gastroenterology. And what that does, that overcrowds the specialist, specialist clinics with simple cases that could have been dealt with at a primary care level. And the other issue is misdiagnosis, uh, especially with IBS and patients with Crohn's disease, and they're, they're treated as IBS for a long time before uh, diagnosis. So next I'll move to the why. Uh, so I gave you an idea of the sort of scale of the problem and move to why it's important to make the diagnosis of IBD. So I think we've used this slide a number of times now from uh, the Lehman, the, the, the landmark trial by, by, for the Lehman Index. Um, and I think it's, it's a really important uh, uh, slide just shows you that the how important it is really to treat early and have that window of opportunity. I think uh, Peter spoke about this uh, earlier in his talk, and we know I think it's well established with Crohn's disease that if you don't treat early, you get the the known complication of strictures and penetrating disease and eventually surgery. But I think it's uh, what's also no, underestimated maybe is also ulcerative colitis, and that, that there is a window of opportunity also in ulcerative colitis. Um, which is, which is uh, maybe not uh, as people not as, as concerned with it as Crohn's disease, uh, where a delay in diagnosis can lead to disease extension and, and even complications such as narrowing and decreased and anorectal complications as well, and obviously malignancy and surgery as well. So just to look at uh, disease progression and Crohn's disease, this is data from the, uh, a Dutch cohort looking at how our patients, uh, how the disease the, the, remember we spoke about the Montreal classification, so the one you want is the B1, which is the inflammatory phase. And you can see how that inflammatory phase really decreases with time if you don't treat the patients and you start getting more of the B2s and B3s that are resistant to our uh, medical therapies. And these patients would end up having uh, surgery. And you can see that as early as, in the, in the second graph, you can see as early, oh, it doesn't work, okay. Oh, it's that's it. So, oh, a point here, okay. The pointer doesn't work. What do you do, the pointer? So is it here or is it, uh -huh. ah, I used it here, okay. So I'm just trying to get grips on this. So as you can see, as early as, uh, no, I think you moved the slide. Yeah. Okay, so as early as five years, you start getting, uh, pretty early, you start getting complex, uh, complicated disease if left untreated. In terms of the surgery rates as well, as you can see with, with time, um, this is data from a Scandinavian cohort, you can see there is higher uh, risk of surgery with time, uh, and the patients having with, with time not even one operation, but even multiple surgeries, and this was reproduced as well in multiple other uh, cohorts uh, in the world as well. Uh, in terms of perianal disease, also shows a similar pattern. So with time, you get an increase in perianal disease, and the problem with that is that with increasing perianal disease, you have uh, comes associated with the risk of higher risk of surgery, including cetones, incision and drainage, and in extreme cases, even diverting stomas. So yeah, and then we move on to ulcerative colitis. So. This is something maybe that we, we all know about Crohn's disease, how progressive it is, but we also we sometimes underestimate ulcerative colitis, and, and that is also has an element of disease progression. So this is data just looking at that the, that the Montreal classification of E1, E2, E3 doesn't, tem doesn't uh, always stay in that order, stays in E1. So someone with a proctitis can progress to a left-sided colitis and, uh, and even a pancolitis. As you can see, the over rate, uh, over rate of extension is around 22%, and in this cohort, show it was higher in, in, in North America compared to, to Europe, and that was higher in younger patients compared to older patients. And why are we worried about disease extension? Well, because of the risks that comes with it. So 
with more disease extension, you can see here that there is higher risk of having a colectomy and higher risk of, of colorectal cancer and even higher mortality with, the, with more extensive disease. And uh, as I said, we always think of Crohn's as a progressive disease, but there is, a, there is data to show that, that there's also, ulcerative colitis is a progressive disease and, and there's elements of fibrosis, even stricturing in, in, in when it progresses. This is uh, data from APT published in 2018, looking at around 90 patients that underwent a total colectomy. And you can see that there was submucosal fibrosis in over 100% of the all, all the involved colonic segments. And the degree of fibrosis correlated with the severity and the chronicity of the inflammation. So the more chronic inflammation the patient had, the more fibrosis they found on their specimens. So as you see, as your UC is also a progressive disease, so it can have uh, progressive uh, structural changes, such as strictures, pseudopolyposis, which can be challenging in terms of surveillance as well. When you survey your pac patients, when you have uh, pseudopolyps, it makes it very challenging to survey these patients. You get uh, functional abnormalities in terms of compliance and decreased contactility and motility. Um, an anorectal dysfunction despite healing of the inflammation. If you do it too late, the patient can have long-standing uh, chronic uh, anorectal symptoms despite you uh, treating it, uh, treating the, the inflammation. So next we'll move to the how and what we can do to treat or to, to overcome this, the, the delayed uh, referrals, the pattern that we see in IBD. So there's the, the red flag index, which was developed by Sylvia's group, uh, published in 2015, uh, which was a, uh, a really simple sort of cute uh, index that you can use. Um, bas basically gives you a list of symptoms and signs that when present, there's a coefficient. You give a scoring, a weighting for each one, each one and the higher the, the score, the higher chance of of this patient having uh, Crohn's disease. And a red flag index of over eight points was associated with 94% with sensitivity and specificity for Crohn's disease. And this score was looked at in a, in a regional population, looked at Mahmoud and Mahmoud Mosley's team. Um, and what they did is they, they looked at 255 patients that, present, that were labeled with IBS that presented to an internal medicine uh, clinic. And what they found out of these uh, so-called IBS patients that around 55% of those had a, a red flag score of over five, so a high uh, red flag score. Uh, and what was significant, the multivariate analysis, that the, for patients to have that red flag score was they, were, they weren't seen by a gastroenterologist. Just shows you that, that the importance of, of uh, not mislabeling patients, and it happens a lot in our practice, uh, especially in non-specialist clinics, and, and maybe adding this simple tool at a primary care level or even at an internal medicine level, uh, I think it will be quite useful to... Uh, to, to increase the detection of, of, uh, of IBD cases. And, and this is sort of an algorithm that we, uh, they, so we suggested. The red flag index just looks at, at Crohn's disease. So, so this was one that we suggested that just looks in general at, at all the alarm symptoms uh, to, to both decrease the, 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 to decrease the under referral and the over referral of cases. Um, so this is a tool that, that primary care can use. So you look at the symptom, for example, diarrhea. The questions would be, is this bloody? Is it persistent? And is, is the infectious workup negative? And if, it's, if this is, for example, uh, the case and the patient is maybe worthwhile referring to, to uh, secondary care. And the same with abdominal pain. Are there nocturnal symptoms, raised inflammatory markers, family history of IBD? Uh, unexplained iron deficiency, anemia, and having rectal symptoms. So with either having one of those or with combination would make, would make it worthwhile referring this patient to uh, specialist care. Other interventions that we felt can, can help in, in, delay, in, in combating uh, delayed referral is education of both the patients of the signs and symptoms. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, of the signs and symptoms of IBD and when to present themselves because we know there's a two-month delay uh, already in the patients presenting to their primary care and also the primary uh, uh, care physicians as well. And in our center, we established, because of the over-referral problem, we've established a triage clinic where all the referrals from primary care are actually evaluated, triage to know which one uh, get expedited referral to, to an IBD clinic versus one that would be maybe redirected to back to primary care or to, uh, for example, another specialty. Uh, the last thing is to look at an exciting field. I think this is a really great work by the PREDICT study team by jean frederic uh, Colombel, uh, where they looked at how to detect preclinical IBD. There were two publications. One was in APT in 2016, and the other was in Gastro in 2020. Um, and what they, what they did in the study, they're trying to identify preclinical uh, 
serologic and, and uh, proteinomic biomarkers that can predict Crohn's disease. So the first study was smaller. They were looking at U.S. Army personnel that get blood checked anyway. And what they did is they, they, they looked at the, they took four samples from the patient at different time points before diagnosis. And then once they're diagnosed, they also looked at these after diagnosis. And they measured the antimicrobial antibodies in the first study. Um, and then they found the associations between the presence of these antibodies and the risk of developing complications of Crohn's. The second study was larger, and they looked at the antimicrobial antibodies as well as the, a panel of over a thousand biomarkers. Uh, and a larger cohort, around 200 with Crohn's, 200 with UC, and 200 healthy controls. Uh, and they, they, they analyzed on a multivariate model to, to predict disease status. So that's the design, it's a complex study. Uh, where you get multiple blood samples and then you get the patients tested uh, for these uh, various antimicrobial and proteinomic uh, biomarkers. So in the, in the first study, what they found is that in a median of six years, in patients with Crohn's disease, so in a median six years before diagnosis, these patients start to develop the antimicrobial antibodies and the titer increases with closer to the, to the date of diagnosis. And what they found is the more uh, the higher the titer and the number of the of these antibodies, the more complicated the the, the phenotype. And in the second study, uh, they actually uh, identified a 51 uh, protein biomarker panel that 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 identified Crohn's disease with 76% accuracy five years before diagnosis and 88% accuracy at one year before diagnosis. But they didn't see a similar panel in um, for ulcerative colitis. So just to, to summarize with some take-home messages, so IBD does seem to be increasing in, in Kuwait with a, with a slightly maybe different genetic profile to the West, uh, which might indicate a possible larger role of environmental factors that deserves, I think, further study. A delay in the diagnosis is common and associated with, with poor outcomes. And measures that we've sort of suggested uh, as part of our, our expert group is, is education of primary care physicians, the use of red flags, and maybe use of triage clinics, which were quite effective. It's a pro IBD is a progressive disease and can res result in, in bowel damage that requires uh, surgery, as well as other functional uh, abnormalities. And uh, we have to target that window of opportunity where our, our medications are most effective. And I think preclinical IBD is very exciting, and, uh, and prevention may be a possibility, I think, in the future, uh, which can maybe allow us to identify that subset of patients and initiate some interventions that can either delay or even in the future halt the disease initiation. Thank you very much.